So as we jump into the second section, we're going to kind of focus on some of the technical things that VMware and Peer do together. So if we think about what this looked like at the first part, um, Andrew kind of covered the why, right? The vision, the strategy, why we're seeing customers looking at adopting this. But when we think about kind of the pure platform, one of our kind of simplest things to think about is making sure that our arrays are simple. And what that means is no knobs to turn, no real settings to have to dig into. And so there's no RAID groups, there's no um, storage pools, data reduction is always on, encryption is always on, QoS is always on. Upgrades are actually done by support or now can also be enabled through our edge services, which means you can actually log in and do self-service upgrades as you wish, run your own pretext, do all of this as you need it. So it makes it more simpler for you to be able to manage your environment. And it's important because our arrays just are not built for a single workload. They're made for all workloads. So as we think about it from a VMware perspective, you might have extra capacity and realize, well, maybe I can use this for my databases. Maybe I could use it for my bare metal. Maybe I could use it for my VDI. Each array is built in that way that can handle all of those items. But when we think about how does this apply to VMware environments? Well, data store sizing and volume sizing has always been one of those big questions. How big do I make my data store or how small? How many do I need? And so from a pure perspective, we don't have a per volume performance limit. So really what it comes down to is looking at what is best from a business case. If you're gonna be using this for SRM and VMFS data stores, you might have 200 data stores for your 200 applications. VVOLs can help with that. But if not, if you're using VDI, we see customers carving up two 60 terabyte data stores and just running with it. So it gives the customers and our partners the flexibility to make that own decision. When we think about best practices and optimization, we kind of think of those as bugs. So we do everything we can to partner with VMware to make sure all of our settings are enabled and out of the box. There's still some things you might want to tune later like iSCSI specific settings, but it's very, very helpful. When we think about multipathing, part of the things we've learned along the way is that as VMware matures some of those offerings, so can we. So if you think about our environment in 6.7 and before, we use the standard round robin IOPS equals one, what pretty much all storage array vendors do. Every IO goes down a different path, helps for load balancing. With 7.0 and then eventually backported to 6.7 update three, was the ability to do what we call round robin with latency. And think about it as like an intelligent form of load balancing where every three minutes it sends 16 IOs down, measures the latency. If it's bad, it'll block that path and only use the good paths. This has actually helped troubleshoot some customers' environments where they're seeing really weird IO patterns. Once we enabled that, all of a sudden we saw all the data avoiding one path and we're like, well, you guys have a failed SFP. It wasn't actually in a failed state, but it was degrading. So really things there. Uh, just, just a point, VMware yes. never recommended to use an IOP count of one with round robin. Yeah. The, the path switch swapping actually has overhead associated yeah. with it. So, yeah, and that's why I definitely like moving towards the latency because it definitely helps mature on that and build upon some of those items. And again, all we can do this is with sub millisecond latency and full performance. So when we think about array maintenance or array failures, all of our workloads can run while that's running 100%. And we also have our automatic and always on QoS. Oops. Um, and what that means is if you want to manually limit workloads that some customers are running, um, so certain VMs or certain disks, you can apply bandwidth and IOPS limits. The other aspect of that is our always on QoS that prevents one workload from overtaking the entire array and making sure that there's fairness across all of those. And so when we think about the provisioning, right, one of the first things we did was have this tent card. It just showed that was our documentation. You create a host, you create a volume, you connect it together. And it was a very important thing because a lot of the simplicity is kind of that building block for a lot of that automation. And so really when we create volumes, all you have to do is choose a name and choose a capacity. And what that name and capacity is can be whatever you want. You don't have to worry about storage pools and all of those individual items. But as we build upon this simplicity, a lot of our customers have adopted to use some of the integrations we have. So our vSphere client plugin, I would say it's a really great way to manage some of the built-in capabilities, host management, data store management, and snapshot management. Because a lot of customers will ask, well, do I create a host? Do I apply a host to a host or a, a volume to a host or a volume to a volume group or a host group? 
And so what this allows you to do is as simply as right-clicking a cluster, you can say configure cluster. It'll add the host objects based off the host names, the cluster object based off the cluster name, and configure iSCSI automatically for you. Whenever you have to set up all those targets, you're like, did I set all the mappings properly? Did I set all those advanced settings properly? And what does that actually do? And so the plugin is kind of not only an automation platform to build upon that, but there's also some built in health checks to make sure that it is configured in the proper way. There's actually one fun thing there. One customer shall remain nameless actually admitted, and we've had this happen a couple of times, where they actually forgot to log into their peer system because they spent all the time in their vSphere client after mm -hmm. they set up and they did everything there. And then they had to work with support to figure out how to get into the flasher, right? Yeah. And then when we think about data store management, right? As I said, provisioning volumes is simple, but what happens when you provision a data store? You have to create that volume, assign it to a host group, rescan that cluster, go ahead and provision that data store, make sure it's protected how you need. With our data store management, we single click work that for you, but we also make some enhancements like being able to place it in an active DR pod or an active cluster pod or an async protection group. But there's also intelligence that's built into that. With our Pure One AI Ops, we actually measure a very simple to consume number of each array, and that's load. We're not gonna expose CPU, we're not gonna expose memory, we're not gonna expose IO balance, because if you're not using it for front-end IO, we're probably using it for those back-end operations. So when you go ahead and create that data store, we're gonna show you all of your arrays, and we're gonna show you load and capacity. And so when you're looking at this, if you see an array that's at 70% load, but three capacity, you can be like, well, I don't need to put something performant, but I can put something capacity bound. Or if I see another array that's at 20% load and 50% capacity, you can make some of those intelligent decisions to make sure you're placing that data store in it. And again, we have integrations with that with all of our APIs as well, as well as our, um, our PowerShell command lines. As we build upon this, VMware has also introduced a remote plugin architecture where plugins are no longer pushed and installed directly to the vCenter. They're run from a remote OVA, it's downloaded and run from there. What that's allowed us to do is build upon what we've been doing and make things better. So if we think about vVols, we now have the ability to do VM point in time recovery for vVols. And a point of this is really thinking about the automation and being able to revert very, very quickly to a known point in time. Think about the ransomware mitigation scenario where you had something compromised, whether it was a bad actor encrypting something, or whether you had a rogue admin come in and deleted a VM or wrote some data, deleted it. Shut down the VM, reverse it, and we're gonna, talk, we're gonna kind of show a quick demo of that later. And even the simplest things, right? Role-based access control was brought back with the new version of the plugin. This gives the ability to granularly provide different admins different level of resources. So we talked about everything the plugin can do, but why not give read access to the app admins? Your storage team may not want the VMware team doing anything, so they're gonna give them like operator access provision data stores. But your storage team might have the full access or the VMware team might have that full access to do anything it is. So any single button has an individual workflow that can be limited. What I'm also really excited to talk about are gonna be some of the new features in our upcoming version of the plugin 5.2, and it's VVOL Insights, right? VVOLs already gave you the ability to have granularity, but what we have the ability to do is tie into new VMware APIs and provide guest insights, partitions, guest-ridden data, mount drives, file system formats, all of that. A lot of customers may not be ready to adopt VVOLs, or they might still wanna rely on VMFS. We've also introduced a full VM recovery for VMFS. So, Traditionally, it's an eight-step workflow, right? Take a snapshot, copy it to a volume, copy that volume to your host, re-signature, register your VM, storage your motion, and then kind of go backwards. And so all this very single-click automated workflow. Another really great feature is VVOL Replication Manager. We had the ability to do native replication, and we're gonna talk about this a little bit later, of your VMs, be able to do test failovers and full failovers. What VVOL Replication Manager usually needed to do was interact with APIs. So PowerShell, native REST API, or with VRealize Orchestrator. And so now what we did is we brought all of that into the vSphere plugin and actually makes that very easy. Again, another demo we'll show. And then an updated storage policy wizard. As some of the challenges, well, we've rose ab above those and we've introduced new SPBM policies, QoS, a new snapshot limit. So we've updated our snapshot workflow to be able to account for that. But Again, there's more. We can do PowerShell, we can do REST, we can do Python, we can do Ansible, we have Terraform providers for our cloud block store offering. 100 workflows out of the box with vRealize Orchestrator tied in with vRealize Automation, but use this for everything you need to do if you don't wanna use that plugin. It's very easy to automate. But I always say good developers don't always write their code from scratch. They look at examples, see what's out there. We have a whole code community out there, code.peerstorage.com. We have a Slack and a community. And what's really important to understand is 
we have customers who have already done this. They've solved challenges. They've written about them. When you go out there and search, it's an open base. If you have a question, you consult with our partners, our employees, our engineers are even in there. And we take valid feedback. So it's a really great community to be part of and see what is actually existing out there. But as we kind of dive in a little bit deeper, um, let's look at some of our integrations. So Site Recovery Manager is really one of those big things that customers are looking at when they look at DR. And I'm from Florida, so I tend to feel like as soon as it hits like March timeframe, every call starts talking about business cont continuity and disaster recovery. What can we do? And so the shift goes from like VDI from like the beginning of the year because they just hired on a whole bunch of employees <laughs> to this, right? How can I do this? What are the failure scenarios? How can I protect it? We think back a little bit, Pure has three forms of replication. We have asynchronous periodic, which is that scheduled shipping of snapshots from one array to another, as low as every five minutes. We have our active DR, which is our continuous async. So it's essentially synchronous without the synchronicity, where it's constantly streaming data to the second array. RPOs as low as one second. It's not waiting for that acknowledgement back. So it's made for those customers who want less than five minutes and want to have the lowest RPO possible. And with this, we use our SRA, a very seamless workflow. We also have the ability to work with stretch storage with our active cluster, which is our synchronous zero RPO, zero RTO replication. Handle that full orchestration of that provider. But some customers want the best of both worlds. They might have a highly, a highly available application within their primary data center stretched between those with a stretch cluster, but then they might want to bring that off to a third site. And so being able to integrate that to not only do a local failover, but a remote failover, definitely kind of helps from that perspective and making sure that we have full support, not just to do this, but integrate with all of our new features that are coming out. So active DR, active cluster, safe mode, making sure that we can build upon a lot of those immutabilities where things cannot actually be changed. So as we've looked at some of this and even the VMware, the vSphere client capabilities, we haven't hit a lot on containers yet, but a lot of the capabilities that we have there accrue up into that layer. And I'm pulling something forward, but I don't want to guess what the most the, uh, the most common method is to deploy containers inside data centers on top of what layer? Oh, it might nice. be a gimme. VMs. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> a lot of this right, stuff man. we've talked about, we pull it into container conversations. Anything you want yeah. to kind of add there in the core VMware stuff before we go to Vivo? Yeah, no, I think it's just there. It's the way that they're building applications and the, the data sets. There's many different ways, whether it's a container approach and a connector approach or a pool approach. And I think... Being able to consume that storage is a very important thing, and those are kind of where we kind of tie in those solutions. This is whether it's Tanzu, whether it's OpenShift on VMware, I'm not picking favorites here. There's a diversity out there from an environment mm -hmm. standpoint, and all of this ends up playing in there. Yeah. So. We're definitely going to be talking about Tanzu and Kubernetes and Portworks um, at a session. I think it's Wednesday. You open, you're doing? You open the door, so I'll ask the question. Yeah. But can't you? Could you still use pure storage as a CS for uh, bare bones? Yeah. Kubernetes, bare metal. Yeah, so bare metal servers, right? Mm -hmm. A really popular use case. Some customers have SAP systems where everything has to run in RAM and scales outside the bounds of that. So whether it's really any particular workload from Oracle, SAP, um, Elastic, we have solutions use cases where my team focuses on. So VMware, all the hypervisors, the cloud, but also Oracle, SQL, SAP, um, our converged infrastructure, like our flash stack. So we have can definitely go down that rabbit hole. And we have um, Craig back there who focuses on a lot of our Cisco validated designs. Mm -hmm. So we have a joint partnership where we're looking at these end-to-end -end workflows of virtualized platforms, VDI platforms, server platforms, databases, really anything you name it, reference architectures for all of those. So I, I was actually one of the customers that lost access to pure storage because y'all literally took care of everything that I uh -huh. needed to do with it. You're have you ever welcome. thought about? Yeah, I, think, <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, have you ever thought of uh, like a SaaS 2.0 marketing structure and where you're actually like an MSP of storage? So that is a, a yes. Um, definitely discussions around that in various ways, even talking with some um, various other providers. I, I think the closest that I would refer to you there is probably our partnership with Equinix and some of what we do there. And even what we do, some of what we do from an as a managed service capability, we used to call it pure as a service, now we call it Evergreen One, starts to wander towards some of that where it's full on OpEx, but inside your data center. Uh, there's some futures that I don't think I'll con comment on this context, but again, I love the question. I'm not just saying it. So, and yeah. sorry, or you're welcome, whichever is appropriate to your your previous comments. Both. So, okay. yeah, I think some of that too is also with the Fusion platform, where it's going to kind of provide that management plane across all those. So it's going to be kind of your fleet management. So again, 
the idea goal is not having to actually go to your flash arrays. Is it necessarily a bad thing, right? Normally you would go in there and do that. And a lot of the things that have been built on have enabled that, right? The vSphere plugin. You think about our engineering's goal is everything that you do, if it was up to them, they would remove the UI from the flash array altogether. Think about kind of what ESXi was with the service console, right? You just, <laughs> it was just there, it was to manage it. And I think that's ideally is once it's enabled, all of these cloud-based services enable you to do everything you want from a simplicity standpoint. First off, thank you for sharing your comments and being a customer. Appreciate you uh, 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 sharing that with the audience and, and hopefully that's an endorsement. Um, uh, <laughs> obviously we're not here to, to, to break any news or share anything that they, we are or, or aren't working on, but I would, would share that if you look at our financial earnings where we talk a lot about the growth of our subscription business, um, it's been very aggressive. It's really aligning towards um, whether on-prem or in the cloud, but how customers want to make their purchases today it's been an outstanding success for us. I think we are uh, well ahead of the, the storage industry in terms of our offerings and how that evolves and what partnerships it evolves with. There's a robust roadmap and I think that's probably about the best way to share it right now.